Well, good morning, Pathway. Good morning. Oh, come on. We just got done worshiping the Lord. Good morning, Pathway. Good morning. That's better. That's better. It's great to be with you all this morning. Well, I have the incredible privilege of being able to introduce Pastor Jim Halstead, who's going to be preaching for us this morning. He's been a minister for 35 plus years. He's the founding pastor of Go and Tell Ministries, which is a missions organization that teaches to equip churches in strategic evangelism. And I thought it'd be a great opportunity, especially with us getting ready to go into our, our evangelism class, which we start here this Wednesday, to be able to have him come and speak to us this morning. Now, what is our purpose here at Pathway? We are to know Jesus Christ, and then what? To make him known, to make him known. That's what it's all about. So if you will, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Pastor Jim Halstead. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Pathway, for having me here. It's been a blessing to develop friendship with uh, Pastor Eddie and also with Ben as well. And it's great for pastors to meet other pastors who love Jesus to help delight in Him. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the welcome. And what uh, we're going to be looking at today, the uh, text, which, you know, I, I have pastored for over 35 years. I have uh, also was a special education teacher for East Allen County uh, for, for 10 plus years. I've taught literally kindergarten to uh, 12th grade in special ed. I, I joke, I, I taught... Uh, Every decade I taught for two years, basically, is kind of what I did, sometimes as bivocational pastor. And, and what I've realized over 35 years of pastoring, over 10 years of teaching, when Jesus said the great commandment, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, that truly sums up what it means. As your mission statement, it is what? To know Him and to make Him known. I'm going to be sharing some stories as I talk, but I, as a special ed teacher for confidentiality, I'll be changing the names of my students. But one thing that's it's funny, as, I, as I've taught for over 10 years, I, I realize what you remember with the teachers that you cared for in your love, you don't remember their lesson plans. Why do you remember the relationship they had with you? And, you know, it's interesting, uh, through social media, I got to connect uh, with a, gosh, a student that I was their high school teacher back in 82. So you got to be some years there. And her daughter noticed that we were friends and messaged me and says, uh, who are you that my mom talks so highly of you? And I said, well, I was her teacher. Her comment message was, that's weird. <laughs> she says, why would she want to connect with you? I said, well... I always believed in your mom. And she responded, well, that's kind of cool. I, I taught junior high for several years, and I was at New Haven Middle School. Uh, so I've heard some people at New Haven. And when, when I was finished, I was going on next year to an elementary school. And my junior high class wrote me a note. And if this isn't the most perfect junior high note a teacher could ever get, I don't know what is. I always joked with all my students. I didn't really joke. I kind of meant it. You're my favorite student because I loved all my students. And so they, they wrote a card. They knew I was leaving and I was going to elementary school the next day. So my last day of school, they wrote a card. On the front of the cover, it said this, we just want you to know that we're going to miss you. And you open up the card and all the kids wrote their names, had their symbols and, you know, I'm your favorite student. No, he likes me better. No, he doesn't like you. He likes me. And, and then, so again, on the front cover says, we just want you to know that we're going to miss you. And then you had all the signatures, but in bold print it said this, but that doesn't necessarily mean we liked you. <laughs> and if that's not a best junior high card, I don't know what is. And then just last year I taught special ed at a kindergarten to second grade class. And I, I had Matthew. Matthew was a child uh, with autism, was only going half day. And they told me when I was his new teacher that it takes a while for him to get to know anyone. He's probably not going to say much to you. And he didn't. Towards the end of the first week, I'm getting him ready to get on the bus. He had to leave early, and I'm all, literally on my knees. I'm zipping up his coat, and I look at him in his eyes, and I say, Matthew, I love you. 
I always remember that. He looked at me back. His first words to me was, Mr. H, I love you. And then I'm on my knees. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Can you help me up now? Because <laughs> I'm an old man and he helped me up. And I, and I realized by, by teaching and by pastoring, it all has summed up that you love God and you love others. And the verse we're looking at today, and, and this is the NIV version, is the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. With that, join me as I, as I pray for the blessing of this morning's message. Father, as I come this morning, I ask you to anoint this congregation with your presence. And through that, that you would raise up workers for your harvest field. And Father, now I ask, may the words of my mouth and may the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. The three things we're going to look at, you're going to know this first when we get done. Point number one, only thing that counts. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The only thing that counts. You know, to grasp that is we have to again realize, if, when's the last time you've gone to a funeral? You know, when you go to a funeral, you realize the things that really Count. In Ecclesiastes 7 2, it says, It's better to go to the house of mourning than a house of feasting, is because death is the destiny of everyone, and the living should take this to heart. You begin to grasp that when you go to funerals or you see with people the things that count. And let me ask you this if you had 24 hours to live, just 24 hours to live, for some reason you would know that today, what would you do with those 24 hours? What would you do? And you, as you begin to think of that, you begin to think of, well, who would I call? Who would I want to be with? Who would I want to give a blessing to? Or who would I want to reconcile with? Who would I want to share a legacy with? You begin to think of relationships because you realize what you're not thinking is, well, I, I'm not going to play the lottery. I'm not going to buy a big car. I'm not going to buy things because in 24 hours those things don't matter. The things that matter are relationships. Your relationship with God and your relationship with other people. That's why the saying, live every day as if it was your last, makes sense. Now, I don't know what I would do if I had 24 hours to live. Maybe you don't know what you would do, but I do know this. I do know someone who knew they had 24 hours to live, and I know what they did. It was Jesus. He knew he was going to die on the cross. And what did he do? He loved on his disciples. You, you know this text. The Last Supper. He gathers disciples. And what scripture say? It says, it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and he wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus knew he was going to the cross, gathered disciples, you know, the upper room discourse that's going to follow, and he showed them the full extent of his love, it says here. <laughs> he washed the disciples' feet as he loved them, and I think when he was washing disciples' feet, I think he looked into his eyes, every disciple, and shared his love to them. His passion for them. You know, later on that night, Jesus was going to say, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you what? Love one another. The only thing that counts is loving God and loving others. And Jesus did that with the disciples. Matter of fact, after he washed his disciples' feet, what did he say? He said, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, 
you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. It's to love those God has placed with you. And we're talking about evangelism as I literally train people throughout the world to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I train people who normally have never shared. I'm not asking people, and I don't think your pastor is asking you to go to the courthouse downtown and to preach on the corner. He's wanting you to bloom where you're planted. He's wanting you to pray for the loss that God has brought into your life. Your neighbors, your co-workers, your family members. Where you go shop, the people you have relationships with, that God has brought into your life. He's wanting you to pray for them and to love them, not only in deed, but then in word of sharing the gospel. When I was teaching at that junior high, one of the kids that signed that was, I'm going to call him Adam. He was an eighth grade student, came from a really dysfunctional family, broken family. This young man is an eighth grader. He was almost as tall as I am. He was a pure athlete as I've ever seen. Never had a chance to be on any athletic teams just due to problems with his family, having to help care younger brothers and sisters. As I was teaching him, the football coach was begging him to play football. I mean, this kid, it was, it, he was Hercules, incredible athlete. And he always said, oh, I can't go out, I can't go out. Then he finally came into class one day. He said, oh man, the coach really wants me to play. And my mom says I could, but we don't have money for the physical. And I have to have a physical. Well, that day, my coach, who was instrumental in leading me to faith in Jesus Christ, when I was 17, had just passed. And someone had told me, it was Coach Mustin from Plainfield High School. And I was getting ready to send flowers and a card, and all of a sudden it occurred to me, Adam comes in and says he needs a physical, and I thought, you know, Coach Mustin, he wouldn't want flowers, but I bet you he would want me to pay for this kid's physical for it. So I talked to athletic director, paid for a physical. Adam comes in the next day, and he's all excited. You're not going to believe it, Mr. H. Someone paid for it. I'm going to play football. The next night he plays football. I volunteer to be one of the chain gang, the 10-yard the marker, because I wanted to be on the field and see this. The second, he's a running back, and again, this kid is, is mammothly strong and fast. Second time he gets the football, he runs 70 yards for a touchdown. He gets in the end zone. He's never played football before. He's had one or two practices. He got in the end zone, and he didn't know what to do. So he did what he saw on TV. He spiked it and he started dancing. Well, flags go flying because you can't do that in junior high. I'm with the visiting coaches right behind me and I'm on the chain and I'm kind of going, way to go, way to go. And he goes, what's that kid doing? It's like he's never played football. I looked at the coach. Well, he hasn't. He says, it's only his second day. Well, as much as he liked football, I liked basketball more. And my son is now a, the grad assistant coach at Grace College. He played basketball at Grace College. And I got Adam to be on the team that he was in, third or fourth grade, who coached him. Pure athlete, and the kid was good, and he got to practice. I started meeting him after school, went to another gym, teaching him how to play basketball. My son would teach him. And after months of helping his Adam after school, we we're done in the gym, cooling off, having a water. And he goes, Mr. H, why have you done this for me? No one has helped me like you've helped me. And I said, well, Adam, I've, I've done this for you because there's more to life than football and their basketball. He goes, well, well what, what is life? Let me ask you a question. If you were to stand before God and he'd say, why should I let you have it? What would you say? He gave a works answer, no church background. He admitted he was a sinner. I shared the glorious news of Jesus Christ. And he prayed with me to receive Christ that day. You see, it's, it's just, God wants you to bloom where you're planted with the people he's brought into your life and to love people, not only in deed, but in words. Because unless we share the gospel, people won't know how to accept Christ or, or know him. But not only did Jesus do that, what else did Jesus do? He not only loved his disciples, he loved his father. After the Last Supper, remember he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed? He, it means Jesus, withdrew about a stone's throw beyond the three, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not 
my will, but your will be done. Jesus modeled, he modeled loving God and loving his neighbor that last 24 hours. He modeled that it wasn't about his desire or his will, it was loving his Father. And what did that mean? Going to the cross and dying. Maybe in your life you've had struggles, you've had hardships. God is with you in the midst of those hardships and the purpose of life is not having no hardships. The purpose of life is loving and knowing Jesus Christ. Several years ago, I, was, I resigned from a church. I didn't know what next step I was going to do. I didn't uh, have my next job yet. And my son, again, who's college coach now, was in fourth grade. I had no job, and I was taking him to Maryville, Indiana, to play in a basketball tournament. And so while we're driving, if you know, you was at 33, you're driving to Maryville, there's nothing much along the road. And I'm just praying. My son's in the back seat watching the DVD. And I'm just praying, God, I, I need guidance for the future. I don't know what's going on. My, my wife had just been healed from brain surgery. I had a senior in high school, two elementary kids. I didn't have a job. I'm like, God, I, I don't know where I'm going, but I, I trust you. I know you. And I was just praying. And then during my prayer, God responded back. I didn't hear his audible voice, but he kind of impressed upon my heart this. He goes, look at your son. And I turned in my rearview mirror and I looked at him and he's just watching the DVD. Smiling. And the Lord impressed upon my heart. He goes, Jim, Stephen doesn't know where the tournament is located. He doesn't know where the gym is. He doesn't know where the hotel he's staying. He's having no concept of the cost and the food. All he knows is this, that his father is going to take care of him. And then I thought of Jeremiah 29. I know the plans I have for you, plan, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And I'm praising God. Thank you, God. I don't know where I'm going, but I know you're going with me. I know you're going with me. I'm thanking him. And then at that moment, God impressed upon my heart again. Look at your son again. And I looked in the rearview mirror. And right when I looked at him, he's laughing with joy. And I'll always remember what the Lord impressed upon my heart at this moment. He says, Jim, there's one thing I want you to do. I want you to enjoy the ride. <laughs> I want you to enjoy the ride. You don't know where you're going. You don't know how I'm going to provide for you. You don't know what this next step is. But I want you in faith to follow me, and I want you to enjoy the ride. Meaning what? I want you to enjoy me. See, the only thing that counts is what? Enjoying and walking and delighting in God. And loving others. Jesus modeled that those last 24 hours, but it also it says in this verse, not only that the only thing that counts is what? Is faith. Expressing itself through love is faith. And, and I put in the, the notes, it's faith in Jesus. There's a lot of people today that have faith, that faith that things are going to work out. Faith in what? A lot of people have faith in faith. They don't have a faith in the person of Jesus Christ in His death and resurrection. They just have faith that things are okay and things aren't going to be okay. Matter of fact, in Proverbs it says there seems to be there's a way that's right to man, but the end leads to death. I don't know if you saw this in July. In the country of Colombia, people were bungee jumping. Now, I, I'm kind of scared of heights. I, I would just be scared. It would be an adventure for me to be up looking out at a bungee jump tower. Okay, that would be my adventure. But, but true story, very sad story. A couple was going there. hundred people were paid that day to, to bungee jump. This was the 90th person to jump. The guy was all had a harness on. His fiancée had the harness on, but he had the bungee jump tied to his harness. She did not. The guy gave him the thumbs up for him to jump. He went like this, and he looked at his fiancée with the thumbs up, and she thought it was thumbs up, you're ready. And she ran and she jumped. She had no cord. They did an autopsy. They literally said she died of a heart attack in the fall. Not the fall killed her. She literally died in the fall. There's a way that seems right to, the end, to man, but in the way it leads to death. There's a lot of people have faith. Everything's going to be okay when they die. But apart from Jesus Christ, what? There is no salvation. 
There's only one mediator between man and God, and that is a man, Christ Jesus. And we have to have faith in Christ and Christ alone. Matter of fact, the writer of Hebrews put it this way, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists, and He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. It's faith to please God, but it's faith in Jesus Christ. And people are needing to know it's only faith in Him. Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. People don't know the gospel. They think they're going to be okay when they die, and they're not. I don't know if you read this week, Norm MacDonald passed away. If you read it out, he was a deadpan humorous. Comedian was on Saturday Night Live. I remember loving his humor. I don't know if he was a believer or not. I don't think he was, but in quotes that I've read, he had cancer for the past 10 years. Getting sick, he really didn't tell anyone. Gambled a lot. He had all the fame you could want. He had all the riches you could want. And he said this. He goes, I'd rather fear losing money on a football game than ruminating all night about my upcoming illness and death. My biggest problem is ruminating about death. If I could get over that somehow, I'd read books about it. He said this, God is the best in a general term. That's what I'm trying to get to God. You hear that? I'm trying to get to God. Every great novel I read, faith is the only salvation, but I don't know how to get it. He said, I don't know how to suddenly believe I'm too stupid or proud or pretend I'm smart. I've come to it a long time ago that I have to control over everything, but I'm struggling with faith. It's really hard to keep believing because it's the hardest thing to believe. Maybe I'm not deep enough. He's crying out. He wants to believe in something. He's facing death. But I don't know if he ever heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was so close. His pride was keeping him away. The thing he needed to do to come to faith was what? To see his sin and the salvation only in Jesus Christ. The Christian Post posted last month, they did a survey of 3,000 people who claimed that they were born-again Christians. And this blows my mind. 60% of the people said that Jesus, Buddha, and Muhammad were all equal ways for salvation in God. 60% of people who will go to church on a regular basis did this first survey. See, it's only faith in Jesus Christ that you have hope of eternal life. It's only faith in the person, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, and they asked Jesus, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered him, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. It's to believe in the person of Jesus Christ. It's to believe in Him, of His death and resurrection. Just last month, also, another disturbing story. Harvard University announced they have many different chaplains. They have a chaplain who serves for Muslims, who serves for people who have, believe in Buddha, who believe in Hinduism, who believe in humanism. In Harvard, when it was founded by John Harvard in 1636, the motto was truth for Christ and the church, and now the motto is just truth, which is an oxymoron. They just announced their new chaplain over all of the chaplains is a humanist, meaning he doesn't even believe in God. Now, now grasp this. The chaplain, the head chaplain of Harvard, doesn't believe in God, wrote the book, Good Without God, and he's in charge of all the chaplains at Harvard University. You see, the church needs to be equipped to share the gospel. Somehow the church has missed it. That salvation knows only in him. John said this, and this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Friends, as a pastor, I want to tell you, I don't know when you're going to pass away, but you must be prepared to die. You can't think of the illusion because I'm healthy now and everything is all right. The doctor says it's okay. You don't know what next week's going to bring, the next decade, or even the next month. Things are not in your hand. Things don't last forever. We're all going to stand before God someday. And when we face Him, we are not going to give an account 
of other people in our lives who's done us wrong, but we're going to give account of ourselves, of our own sins. And our salvation is only found in Jesus Christ. We have to grasp that. And if we have to grasp it for ourselves, think of the people who God has placed in your life that don't know Him. You may be the only person praying for their salvation. You may be the only person sharing. But we're all going to stand before God because the only thing that counts is faith in Jesus Christ. Just two months ago, I did a funeral for one of my students back 15 years ago, special ed student. His parents started coming to my church and I saw the whole family salvation. Great blessing. Well, the dad adopted Josh. I can use his name because he's outside. He's 21. He's got a job. John passed. He was part of my church, strong friend, moved to Marion four or five years ago, and we kept somewhat contact, but his, his wife called and wanted me to do his funeral. We were close when he was in my church, and I said yes. And you know what I did to do his funeral? I, I told stories that I knew. I knew his salvation story. I knew his love for Jesus. I just looked on his social media account for the past six months. Instagram, Facebook. And from that I got a sermon. I just want to ask you, if your pastor would do that for you, if he looked on your social media account, what would come out of it? For John, it was scripture verses, it was love for Jesus Christ, it was love for others and love for his family. Also a love for the Cubs. Also a disappointment with the Cubs. Love to barbecue. But it was Jesus that came out of that. You see, when you stand before God, you would want your social media account. You would want anything to count. It was your faith in Jesus Christ. It was your love for Him to come out. The only thing that counts is faith. Faith in Jesus being what? Expressed through love. Faith in Jesus being expressed to love through other people. And again, later Jesus said, and this is my command, that you will love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. What? If you love one another in word and deed. Titus 1.16 says, and they claim to know God, but what? They deny Him by their actions. We should be known as the most loving people, the play, people God has placed in your life, from the neighbors to your family members to your co-workers. They should know you as a loving person, not agreeing with everything, but you love them. And it begins by praying for them. Are you praying for the lost by name? You see, what, what we have forgotten as a church, when you pray for people, something happens. As I pray for Pastor Eddie, one thing that happens is I pray for Pastor Eddie, God's going to do something in his life that he would not have done if I did not pray. Right? Isn't that what prayer is? So as I pray for Pastor Eddie, God's going to do something in his life that he would not have done. But when I pray for Pastor Eddie, something else happens. See, when I pray for Pastor Eddie, God gives me his heart for Eddie. I grow in love with him. He changes me. If you want to impact the people that God has placed in your life, if you begin to pray for them, God will break your heart with the things that break the heart of God. And you're going to begin to love them and it's going to flow through you. I think it's why Jesus called us to pray for our enemies. It wasn't to change our enemies. It was to change us. The only thing that counts is faith being expressed through love. And if we don't love, if we don't love others, what is it as a Christian? How did Paul sum it up? Do you know this text in 1 Corinthians? If I speak in the tongues of man and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. You see, the only thing that counts, it's loving God. And then loving others. 
I get 35 years of ministry, 10 years of teaching. It sums up just to that. Just to that. Maybe many of you have heard probably of the love language. Gary Smalley, love language. You've seen this, the five love languages. How many are familiar with this? Yeah, a hand, handful of people. And then the five different love languages. Everyone likes to receive love, but usually you like to receive it or give it in a certain way. One is... Uh, Words of affirmation, you can't really see that that well. Uh, quality time, time spent with someone else. Receiving gifts, giving gifts, acts of service, physical touch. I posted this on my social media account six months ago and all of my kids are all now married and are off college degree and that's why I'm so happy now. That's why I'm so happy and kids are doing well. But I posted this on social media and my youngest daughter Amy Post it and goes, well, Daddy, I know what your favorite love language is. Your favorite love language is quality time. And I responded back on social media, oh, honey, thank you, but that, that's not my favorite love language. That's your favorite love language. And you just think it's mine because I made a point to have quality time with you your whole life. And to love you because that was yours. And then she responded back, oh, Daddy, I love you. And I said... And thank you, that's my favorite love language, is words of affirmation. You've got it, you've got it. See, we all kind of have different love, we all want to love and be receive love in different ways. And I had to learn as a husband, my wife's love language is acts of service, and mine's words of knowledge. So I remember our first Valentine's Day, I wrote her a card, and I actually bought her flowers, because I thought she'd like flowers. And if your love language is receiving gifts, you would want the flowers... But for hers, it's acts of service. And so I had her flowers in a card, words of knowledge, gushy card. And she goes, oh, thanks. And I go, well, where's, where's my gift? She goes, well, I clean the closet. It was acts of service. I'm like, I'm sorry, I missed the memo. What does that have to do with Valentine's Day? <laughs> and so we had a great discussion our first Valentine's Day on our first marriage. And I remember looking at her, hold it, hold it. You're saying for me to express love to you, you want me to do dishes, clean the bedrooms, and do acts of service. She goes, yes. Oh, honey, it's far easier just to buy flowers. <laughs> the discussion continued. <laughs> now, I, I love to do those things for my wife because that's her acts of service. Her mother celebrated her 90th birthday yesterday. I was the one cooking. I was the one doing all these things for my mother-in-law whose love language was acts of service, and my wife. Why? I love my mother-in-law, and I love my wife. You see, if, if you love Jesus, and as you pray for others, God's going to move in your heart to love people, and you're going to do it in a physical way. You know, Jesus gave the warning, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. The kingdom of God is not about your riches. It's not about your prosperity. It's not about your health. It's about loving God and it's about loving others. It's about giving of yourself to others. So last year when I taught, I taught special ed. And I taught in a, in a school that uh, is a needy school. We had free breakfast, free lunch, and, and a lot of needs in the school. And I often taught the, the neediest kids. I got Mike, I had to look at the note, I can't say his name. I got Mike, he was a first grader with the emotional disability. Got him a year ago when school started. See, he wasn't at the school the year before because he was living with his dad and stepmom up in the Michigan, but they abused him. His dad sold drugs, got arrested, CPS got involved and moved him down with his mom who he hadn't seen for several years. She lived in probably the oldest trailer park and the oldest trailer near the school that I taught at. So you had Mike and his mom, Mary, who was on disability, who now got her son, and it was a struggle, and I had him that first week of school, and I noticed at the end of the first week, I called home and talked to his mom, Mary, I said, hey, Mary, this is Mr. H., Mike's <clears throat> teacher, and I just a couple things, and man, it's great having him. He's, he's having a tough transition, but I'm loving on him, but I've noticed you know, he gets a free breakfast, free lunch. He's always hungry. I am actually sharing my lunch in the afternoon with him. 
Are you needing help with food? Because I know you're on disability. I know you just got him. And she paused and said, yes, yes, Mr. H, I need help. And I said, you know, Mary, I, I've noticed also he's worn the same clothes every day all week. Are you needing help with clothes? And she goes, well, well, Mr. H, I didn't think the school helped. I said, well, you know, the school does help some. I'm also known as Pastor Jim. I, I'll help. Could I bring you some groceries this week and every two weeks? Can I bring you a couple bags of groceries and some bags of clothes and help, him and help you? She goes, Mr. H, that'd be so nice. So the next day I brought him some clothes and some groceries and it continued on. And August and every two weeks, September. Got in September, the refrigerator broke and we were able to find a smaller refrigerator and I took it to him on a Saturday and helped feed the family. And I go in and continually giving food and clothing every two weeks and I stopped once and shared the gospel with her as I was giving her food. I gave her tracts. She admitted she was a sinner. She admitted her need. I shared the gospel. She'd never heard it before, but she didn't repent or receive Christ. But she did look at me and goes, Mr. H, I'd love, love for my son to get into a church. I called another pastor who literally was a mile down the road, good friend. He visited the family, shared the gospel with her, offered to get him to church and was helping out as well. Things are progressing. It gets to November and, and Mike is having a hard time with school. He's getting violent in the afternoon so we decide as a case conference committee to have him go half day. <clears throat> she agreed with it on a Tuesday, on a Friday. <clears throat> I go to their house and I said, hey, if you sign this IEP on Monday, he's going to come a half day. I've got this bed bus all set up. <clears throat> Thanks, Mr. H. Thanks for everything you're doing. She signs it. I go, hey, here's some groceries for the weekend. Monday came and Mike didn't show up to school. He never missed. <clears throat> End of the day, the principal calls me into her office. <clears throat> and even when you're a 60-year-old man, you get called to the principal's office, you're kind of scared. <laughs> so I go in, what, what I do wrong? And uh, it's kind of like when Pastor Eddie wants to see you. You ever feel like that? Kind of, yeah, everyone's shaking their head, Eddie. It's always seeing as a pastor. So I go in, I see the principal. My principal is a believer, and my principal also knew everything I was doing after school. Just let her know for <clears throat> courtesy's sake. And she looked at me and goes, Jim, I, I should have told you this before. I've actually talked to Mike's other teachers. I don't even know how to bring this up to you. I'm just going to throw it at you. Mike's mom died yesterday. Uh, CPS is involved. They've already moved him to a hospice uh, placement not hospice placement, <clears throat> um, placement, and um, they're finding a home for him. He's in another county. Uh, she goes, Jim, I, I'm so sorry. I know all you did to help him. You're not going to see him again. Are you okay? I sat down and I'm just, oh my. She looked at me and she literally said, are, are you okay? And I literally said this to my principal. I said, Renita, Mike was hungry, I fed him. Mike needed clothes, I clothed him. The refrigerator broke, I got him a refrigerator. I shared the gospel with his mom and asked her to repent to receive Christ. I had another pastor go share the gospel with her. He asked her to repent to receive Christ. I go, when I stand before God and I have to give an account on Mike's mom, Mary, I think I'm going to be okay. Because I don't know what else more I could have done to tell her about Jesus. She goes, oh my, no other teacher has responded that way. I said, well, I just assumed when you said if I was okay, you meant before God. And she kind of chuckled and goes, and Mr. H, that is why we like having you as one of our teachers. So I just want to tell you right now, the church is not okay. The church isn't sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the lost. The church is not praying for the lost by name. The church isn't even praying for the people that God has brought into their life. The church doesn't even know how to share the gospel. All the church seems to be focused about is our health, our wealth, our needs, our desires. But the purpose of a life, the only thing that counts is loving God and loving others for the glory of Jesus Christ. The church is not okay right now. I've devoted the rest of my life in ministry for one thing, to equip the church to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the pastor, as I've seen it, the church isn't sharing it. 
And I'm not asking you to go share it on street corners. I'm asking you to begin to pray for the people that God has placed in your life. And as you begin to pray, God's going to move your heart and then be equipped to share the gospel. And you just don't do it once. You're involved with them relationally forever. I've prayed for people for literally years and I've seen them come to faith in Christ. The church isn't okay right now. But you're a part of a church who wants to equip you to want to know Him and to make Him known. That's the only thing that counts. The only thing that counts. Because Jesus someday will say to us, remember when He said this? The, he said, the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger invited you in or needing clothes and clothed you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the one of least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. The only thing that counts is faith in Jesus Christ being expressed through love in word and deed. It's the only thing that counts when we stand before God on how well we have loved Him. And as we've loved Him, how well have we loved others. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your love for us in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the faith in Jesus, the forgiveness of our sins. And Father, may we leave this place understanding the only thing that counts is that we know you. And we make you known by loving others in word and deed. Father, I ask that you would raise up workers for your harvest field in this mist for the glory of your name. Amen. The following sermon was presented to you by Pathway Christian of Harlan. If you are in any way encouraged by this message or would you like to know more, we would love to hear from you. Please visit our website at pathwaychristianharlan.com or you can reach out by calling our office at 260-234-8571 or by mail at 12732 Spencerville Road, Harlan, Indiana 46743. Until next time here at Pathway, God bless.